How's it going, everybody? Uh, I'm Sean Robinson with uh, Panasonic Lumix USA, and I'm here with Nick Davis, uh, cinematographer yeah, extraordinaire, excellent. New York based. Yep. Uh, and we're gonna be going over some stuff with the S1H and your shooting experiences with it and some of the pieces that you've shot, um, including one that you just recently shot with yes. it, right? Yeah. Cool. I, I just wanted to show something a little different yeah. Than the other videos that everybody saw already. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Which which was cool, you know, yeah. having having you part of the launch of the S one H in the US, you know, shooting that piece um, with the parkour artists and stuff. That was yeah. it was so cool seeing that. But uh saw a little preview of what you had before, but um how about we go into showing some of the stuff that you just yeah. shot or whichever one you feel like and then should, uh, should we should we start with the with the mix up first? Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah. just start yeah. with the give a, everyone a little uh, refresher of what uh yeah. what was done at launch. Okay. Give me a second, I'm trying to select the appropriate weapon. Uh, watch where you sleeping, them snakes all around, you know they connected. Uh, when I was a kid, my grandmama told me I can't go to heaven. So I stopped praying and asking for blessings and started preparing for my I'ma get it. Got nothing to lose, I'm all in. Walking the ends, don't fall in. Enough of the lies, don't apologize. I don't understand, are you for it? This is the place, this is the site. Grab all your people and log in. I'm waiting, don't care how long it's gonna take. Watching the waiting for that first mistake. Don't come up missing. Don't get it twisted. I'm not Rihanna, but boy, you a gunner. You right on my hit list. Keeping my distance. Just checking the list. Panasonic. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So, a couple questions I want to ask you about. Yeah. So, so in in that piece, there's a ton of uh, you know camera motion with yeah. it, and you're used to working with cameras like the Vericam and some of the Ari, like larger cinema yeah. cameras. Did you find any like controlling differences with this? Things that gave you more flexibility, or, or? Def I I think definitely building it out. You you know these smaller cameras, you have to have like cages and. And like these little pieces that make it work mm -hmm. a lot easier. Um, what I did was because I was using the Ronin S a lot, and you can't really have a cage mm -hmm. on the Ronin S. It kind of like throws it off. So I built my own um, cage. Um, I think it's wooden camera makes like just random plates, mm -hmm. and then yeah, yeah. you could just get a standard, you know, hot shoe. Um, mount and you can put a dovetail on the top. Like oh, a, nice. It almost acts like a d little dovetail. So now when you when you do that, you're only having this little piece. It's like a sliver on the top. Yeah. And then you can attach your motor because I was using little M lenses. Oh yeah, that's so, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you use the little M lenses, it's hard enough just to get a gear around that. So <laughs> it, if you if you mount if you mount like let's just say, normally people would mount the. the the fall focus here, yeah. but you can't because that lens is, the fall focus part would be right here and it's super small. Yeah. It would hit into the body, so you would have to like drop it down from the top. Okay, cool. So that's that. That's what that's what we did with the workaround. Um, plus it's just lighter. Yeah. Because I tried to add like a cage and a monitor and it just like, it just wasn't liking the way, you know, <laughs> like I think it was, it wasn't even the way, it was like the off balance. Yeah, yeah. Because so it is a beefy camera. Yeah, it's not it's not like a regular mirrorless camera where it feels kind of plasticky. Yeah, it it has a lot of like heft to it. So getting it built up closer to some of the cinema cameras you used to working with was like yeah. that initial 
let's get it all built up. Yeah, and then it's we, like you realize you can start to peel things off. because Yeah, like we had PL mount, we had a Leica M mount, and then we also had your lenses, the L mount lenses. Nice. Um, which, you know, like we had our, our thing, like if we were on a tripod or like a car mount, we would just have PL lenses or the L mount lenses just because we can attach the weight to mm -hmm. the cage. Um, yeah. And then so how was how was taking it you know knowing like okay the the match like the setup of the camera how was it shooting with it like for that piece I see a lot of challenging lighting situations yeah. and you know uh, really pushing that vlog as much as you can so like, yeah. can you give and, us a little and insight not only on that? the vlog like the, the weather scenarios <laughs> so like I, I literally I put this camera through its paces because it's I hate to sound like this it sounds snobby but like it's a four thousand dollar camera so if you do break it, or if it is a crash cam, it's not the end of the world. You're not breaking a Veracam or an Alexa, yeah. you know, where it costs a lot more money. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like, you know, they weren't happy about us putting this camera on a car. We only had one time to do it, but we went 130 on the highway with the, <laughs> with the cinema lenses. So like we were, you know, you can do that because like the camera is not that expensive. Yeah, exactly. When, when you think about it, if you need to get a shot that's ridiculous, you can get one. Yeah. And we didn't even go ridiculous because that was the only sample I had. <laughs> and I didn't know I was going to get another one. So if I knew, yeah. then I would have just done some really crazy stuff. Fun part about all the early pre-production models yeah. to shoot stuff with. Mine right? was actually like scotch tape together. <laughs> it didn't even look like a camera. I mean, I, nice. But it, it performed amazing, even though it was like a pre-production. I mean, that's, that's the good thing about Panasonic. They're really built to last. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. that's, that's definitely one of the goals of the product. You know coming from your your background and shooting with these cinema cameras and 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 producing some amazing content how how was you know after you shot this piece and you went through all these different areas how was how was like the grading process was okay, it so how, how did it handle compared I'm gonna be to very your... very honest so so the the vlog and the v gamut is totally amazing right so like when you look at like a camera like the Veracam or an Alexa they're they have a little bit more undertow Mm -hmm. But that's not a bad thing about this camera because this camera sees more in the shadows. So you just yep. have to expose more. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the tonal curve is a little different. Yeah. You don't want to pull up from the shadows. You want to like, you can always take down a yeah. lot more, you know? So like, I think recommending for anybody like that wants this camera is to like actually shoot it mm -hmm. and like figure out how the log curve is on it. Um, I, knew, I knew within a week. I had mine sent. I was out in Miami and I, I um, was just on vacation and I, I shot, you know, I got the camera sent to me and I shot with it for a week. You know, I wasn't convinced in the beginning until I really had to like color time it on a real monitor. Yep. Because that makes a difference. You can't just take this footage and put it on the <laughs> laptop because it, it's just, it's not a, the right way to grade things. It's not the right way to see how far you can push and pull this mm -hmm. camera. So. I think once you go into like a color bay and, and really look at the footage, this footage is amazing. Yeah. So what you're I, saying is it, it really does hang with those higher end cinema yes. cameras, not I would necessarily say the <laughs> I would say it's cleaner and that says a lot considering the Veracam is like one of the cleanest cameras I've ever used. Uh, and I mean, you know, and that's one of the goals that we went with this this product is that, you know, the, yeah. the, S, the, the S series and Lumix in general, we've always been known for video and cinematography. Yeah. That's where a lot of our, our history has been built. So by naturally pulling the GH5 series up into the S series yeah. with this and providing a platform and a tool for someone like yourself yeah. and everyone that's aspiring to get up into this category. Well, the crazy thing is it, this camera and, and you have to thank Taka, who's the engineer mm -hmm. behind this, because he's the engineer. <laughs> I didn't know that until, but when I, when I found out, I, I had a lot more um, hope. You know, no, for real, you know why? Because yep. he's, he's an amazing engineer, and Panasonic is lucky to have him, because he designed the sensor on the Farrakhan, which is an amazing sensor. So, yeah. so the fact that he had a lot of say and and development in the sensor on this camera is huge. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I think that that's where you see the color science. Like when you see the skin tones on this camera, not even picture-wise, I haven't even played picture-wise with it, but the video-wise, 6K, 4K, and I shot, the, the next piece I'll show is in 6K, just to shoot it in 6K, because yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, everything else was in 4K, but the color science on it is nuts. Ah. It really is very good. And I'm not just saying this. Like, I don't. <laughs> I don't. I would never support a camera. I don't care. You can't pay me. 
Yeah. Like, I will only use cameras that are that I believe in, honestly. Right. So with with um, direct in, have you done anything matching this with with Vericam or some of the other yes. cameras you work with? So how how is it handled that kind of environment? Like these are these are one off pieces where it's primarily shot yeah. with the camera, and that's that's where I think a lot of people are going to be using this right now. Yeah. Um, but you know now with the advent of the uh, Netflix Post Technology Alliance yeah. certification of this camera to be in an A category, yeah. Um, you know for for those that are working, and, that, and, how's and it for, handled for and you? F and the funny thing is that you say that is because I, I saw a lot of comments, negative comments about the the whole Netflix thing, um, being like, oh, Panasonic paid to get that, and, <laughs> and to be that. honest, you know, it, Panasonic doesn't pay anybody, you know. <laughs> so like, you know, for a camera. To, for a camera that small, it's a, it's a huge achievement that they got that. I mean, whether Netflix is important or not, it can go on a big screen because we presented our pieces on a big screen in Hollywood. Yes. So like the fact that we saw our pieces at a 50 foot screen and, and it looks that good. Yeah, you yeah. Know, graded in Dolby Vision. Gr yeah, graded yeah. in Dolby Vision. Um, it, it's just like, you know, I was surprised. Yeah. You know, other cameras would break apart. But the 400 megabit file that you get on the 4K is, it really holds up. So that's that's primarily what you typically shoot in, that's, all intra yeah. 400 megabit? Yeah, I've been shooting a lot of 150, believe it or not, and, and I can't tell the difference. <laughs> Honestly. So there I, you go, I, 150 megabit long it, off it, versus it 400 lasts, all on. Yeah, it lasts it last about almost, I don't know, I would say like two and a half times more. Nice. On nice. the card, so, you know, if you're not shooting anything crazy, you know, yeah. if you're doing any green screen stuff, I would say you do the 400. Just in yeah. case for the keying, it's yeah, much having easier. all those frames is going to be important. Yeah. If you're doing the keying work, making sure that you're not yeah. using you know interpreted frames for that. Yeah. Um, well, we just did a piece for for E Network, a whole interview series for uh, E True Hollywood Stories, and we shot in 150, and we did green screen, and it green screened pretty well. Nice. But it was just going to the web; it wasn't like yeah. getting blown up yeah. uh, on a big screen. It's actually I think a good point to to bring up too is you know like these cameras as amazing as they are mm -hmm. on a spec sheet, you know, being able to have something Test. that goes <laughs> from 150 megabit, 400, you know, uh, now 150 <laughs> megabit 4K footage, for 90% of the things that you may be shooting is gonna be more than enough for a lot of people yeah. because you always have to be cognizant of what your output is. And one of the things that I think is shown with this product, with the, the piece that you just saw, with the piece that you shot and, and yeah. how we presented it, um, at the Dolby Vine Theater, was that you have a camera now that can sit for a minor, relatively minor investment in comparison to Vericam, you're able to have a product that will last you infinitely longer than some of the other cameras that yeah. are out there where you're stuck at lower bit rates without 10 bit in bodies that don't have unlimited recording time. Yeah. You know, to where you can and, just let and it then, roll and, and run. Think about it like this. This is not, a, like, this can be an A-cam for anybody that wants it to be an A-cam, but say you're shooting a whole show on Vericam or Alexa or whatever, it doesn't yeah. matter what it is. Um, this camera is, think about it like, it could be the camera with a suction cup on a car. The, the fact that you can actually just get a Matthews suction cup that is you know, e much easier to install than yep. getting a whole grip yeah. to like lay out properly on a trunk or a hood, this can be done in 30 minutes. Yeah. Where that setup could take an hour or two, you know, so it saves a lot more time on set. Just if you want to get that one scene, let's just say, yeah, in, in the back of a car or anywhere, it it could be, you know, it could be a quick shot. Yeah, you know, it could be, you know, you're dragging a dead body on the floor. <laughs> you're not gonna put. No, I'm being honest. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, those movies, you have this big setup. Um, you can get it a lot easier. Yeah, easily done with with that because you know you could just you could have like one grip. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they they call it like a tree hugger, I call it, but you can hang lights on it. You can attach this camera to that and drag whatever you want to drag or attach it to a shovel. Yep. You're not going to attach a big cinema camera to yeah. a shovel. You know, you, so you can get really good point of view and other shots that, that in areas that you can't get into with this camera and you can match it really easily. Yeah. Yeah, so there, Any there, good there, there is no be. fear taking this. Oh, no, no, no. The image that comes out of it is, is right there not. with them. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So do you want to show the, the new piece that you just shot? Yeah, yeah, we'll, definitely. We'll, give, we'll come back and do some more, uh, you know, fill in about, you know, how this next piece was shot. And then um, we're also going to be doing some questions. Can you show that in 24 frames? 
That's all shot in 24 frames. I'm gonna grab the microphone. Yeah. And, and, and the reason why some of it looks sped up is because I actually shot at a 45 degree shutter. So what that does is if somebody's punching, it looks twice as fast. So you, don't get, you get a lot less motion blur. Yeah. They do the same thing in, in fight scenes yeah. all the time. So like when, when they, you can even speed it up and it looks better because it's just like increasing the shutter on a photo camera. Yeah. You just get a sharper, a sharper. And so, uh, so with this, you are using it in shutter angle versus speed. So I it use fits more your. Yeah, I just, I know shutter angle. Like yeah. my buddy just bought the S1H and he is on shutter speed and he's like, what shutter speed should I be? I'm like, I don't know shutter speed. <laughs> I'm like, I just know shutter angle. So I don't you have another question? You have a question too? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So a um, little intro to this yeah, piece. Yeah. So, so this this piece is is in a bronze factory. For anybody that doesn't know what a bronze factory, I just found out they melt bronze and aluminum. <laughs> it's but you know they, it's it's a lot that goes into it. It's they make castings for pipes and anything that that you wouldn't find in like a typical Home Depot or a Lowe's. Um, and and these things are heavy. This place is very hot, dusty. Lighting conditions are natural. There's nothing lit here. I just want everybody to know that. And this is all shot at 640 ISO. Um, cool. And the, the other cool piece about this film is that it's extremely hot and dusty. I really want to explain to everybody that like, even like the last piece, it's shot in real rain, no cover, <laughs> extreme heat. I don't, you know, I didn't care about the camera breaking. Um, this camera can take all the damage you want to give it. Just get the shot. That's pretty much what you want to do. But this is like, we're next to castings that are 2,500 degrees, literally. Like I had to wear gloves. <laughs> the camera's fine. Cool. Yeah. So I just want to say also that this is just like an intro to that piece. It's not done yet. Um, we only shot <laughs> one day and um, our, our buddy got a little sick, so I had to just wait. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it, it is going to be a full piece. This is just like a little teaser with the footage I had. This is including a computer breaking, so like I had to like yeah, right? patch this up together. But so you were saying with that piece that you shot that piece in 6K. I shot it in 6K and... and um, and I did the uh, ProRes to, to 4K. Okay. So, so the cool thing about that is when you shoot the 6K, it's full frame. So you have a lot more room later on um, for, your, for your top and bottom. So the, yeah. so the cool thing is, so the aspect ratio on that is a 1A5, which is typically like a 17 9. Um, so now the cool thing about that is when you're looking at it, when you're doing the post, you still have room up and down. So yeah. like if things are coming into frame um, or if you want to move the frame accordingly, like, like the um, forklift, mm -hmm. we ended up moving 
the footage up. Okay. Just because there was like, you know, logos and stuff like that. I didn't yeah. want to show for the forklift. It, it just didn't look. It looked like it, it was a, like a yellow logo, so I didn't want the eyes to draw. Yeah. To that. Um, so f for those that that are maybe new to the S1H, one of the things is that this camera shoots in 6K in a three by two aspect ratio. So it uses literally the full 35 millimeter sensor image area of this. So that is giving you that that big potential of reframing, restabilizing if you yeah. have to, aside from the fact that the camera's got it's a got five awesome, axis stabilizer yeah. in it. You know, it gives you a lot of that extra creativity um, control. And you, that's, I mean, that, that's a great example of it. Yeah. You know, when you get it, all the people online that ask, oh, why am I gonna shoot 6K? No one delivers in 6K. It's yeah. a lot of that, you're doing this setup because you have that output. And it goes to that point before is, what is your output gonna be? Do you shoot 4K and deliver in 4K, or is it you're shooting 4K to deliver 1080, 6K I mean, to deliver people, 4K? Yeah, people always deliver, like, if you shoot 4K, you deliver 2K yeah. kind of thing. And if you're shooting 6K, it's, it's only proper to go down to 4K. Mm -hmm. um, and then the cool thing is, when you're shooting in 6K, a lot of people will say, oh, but it's only 420, 10-bit. But at the same time, if you, if you do the 420 and you take it down to a 4K, you can effectively get 422. Mm -hmm. Same thing if you go to, from 4K to 2K, you can get 12-bit. So yeah. it's 422, 10-bit, you can take it down to, you can get a 12-bit out of it and just get a little more latitude in post. I don't know how how that really works with the de when it decodes. Yeah, when it does that decoding. Yeah. Um, so so with with that piece. So so you know, like you said, the six K is in four two a ten bit. Um, yeah. Did you find any challenges with shooting that versus the four two two ten bit? Because I mean, on top Definitely, of that, it's an HEVC file. Yeah, you have to you have to transcode. <laughs> I mean, I have a strong computer, but it's just it, it'll bog down any computer. I think just because the compression is very Hefty, mm -hmm. um, you know. Oh, I think all the intra stuff. You just want to like either proxy it or, or do some sort of prores. Okay. I mean, prores adds a little bit more space, mm -hmm. but it, it. I think it's just it's just easier to do a longer form project unless you're doing something for, like a minute, then it's fine. But if you're doing anything longer than two minutes, I would just do like a proxy or do like a like a prores. It'll just be a more a lot more efficient. So, in, and with that piece, being in 4 to a 10 bit, did V-Log, V-Gamut still handle still just fine, fine or did yeah. you find any, any challenges there with it? No, I didn't see any difference in the color. We did, we ran some testing. Um, I didn't, I can't tell the difference at all. Uh, did you white balance? White balance? I just did everything just you daylight. Pose that How did you white balance uh, the camera? You said in post, you? Yes, so I shot everything at, at, at a 5,000 Kelvin on that camera and then later on I just I did a much more stylized grade so I, I did that grade from scratch the reason why it looks dark for some reason there's something going on with this new update in QuickTime because I uploaded it on Vimeo and it doesn't look like that and you know I watch it on my phone but if anybody's asking that it looks dark I'll add a link um, to the B&H website yeah I mean it had a lot more <laughs> it, it, it has a lot more shadow detail um, but but yeah, the, the colors, the highlights, I literally shot for the highlights in that place, and it was all natural. The only shot that we actually lit is because um, we actually stayed till like five, six o'clock and we lost light, so I just added a bounce board out the window, and I just put like in like one of those, uh, like an RE1K daylight, and it just bounced in there. Just to give it a little bit just of balance little, for what you've yeah. already shot. Yeah, because the sparks were gonna like, <laughs> give it like the, the a ambient in there anyway. I just wanted to like kind of like stylize the tools. Yeah. Like on, on the walls, like it had a lot of nice shadows. So when, when you're taking a piece like that, cause I, I, I think that's a good point. Cause I'll, there's a lot of people that ask, that have questions about grading and things like that. So yeah. like what, how, how do you go in and grade your footage? Are you, are yeah. you someone who's just throwing a lot on this oh, thing and working not. or are you LUT actually working with LUT. the there's no such thing as LUTs. <laughs> I, I think, no, no, because you know why? Because think about it like this. Every scenario is different. Every scene is different. Every camera is different. You can't just throw a LUT on anything. That's why a lot of people throw LUTs on cameras and they're like, oh, wow, it's noisy. It's not meant for that, that profile. You know, so like every single camera has a profile, mm -hmm. whether it's Panasonic, Aerie, Sony, Canon, whatever, it doesn't matter. 
every camera's got a different log curve, so you can't just take that LUT and throw it. Um, so what I like to do is I take the manufacturer's LUT, which is, they're always horrendous because they're always oversaturated in every single manufacturer. So you modify that for the scene that you're yeah. in. So I go overboard, I always take a laptop and, you know, an output box and I go to a real calibrated monitor, mm -hmm. um, like a Panasonic or a Sony. Um, and then you just do like a little LUT for that scene. And normally for that area, since we didn't go outside, I just made a lookup for that area. Yeah. And we just stuck with that the whole day because it's less confusing, you know, unless you have a DIT and he starts mm -hmm. grading and all that stuff. Um, I, I think that's the best way to do it. I have three LUTs <laughs> for, for my Panasonic camera. So like the S1H is a little different than the Vericam, so I made three of them. Mm -hmm. for, for this particular piece, I went a little stylized. I went, um, I, I took some references from like Portrait 800, where if you shoot Portrait 800 indoors um, daylight, obviously, because it's a daylight film, it, it renders the, the fluorescence green. So like I just took one of my older photographs that I photographed inside, and I was like, okay, this is cool, but we'll just take this down a notch, mm -hmm. just make it a little darker. So like I just referenced off of that, and and that was the look. Nice. And, yeah, and it looks kind of spooky and cool, and 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 I think it went, you know, it it was like 16 different layers. Yeah. Of nodes. So like if anybody's familiar with Black Magic, whatever that. Oh, uh, the, uh, Resolve, is, Resolve is what you yeah. use. Okay, cool. So the cool thing is you have layered nodes, so you can take things on and off. So if you don't like a shadow or or a highlight, you can always take it out, um, which is cool. And this camera is extremely flexible. Mm -hmm. Like literally, we had like 16 different nodes. I think I think personally, it's better to work with nodes instead of like one big layer, because you kind of like you kind of put yourself in a hole. Because mm -hmm. then if you like want to undo something, because like then I can take the shadows and like ah, we want to cool the shadows a little bit, and that's yeah. just a cool shadow just for that layer. And then if you're like, oh no, we want to go back to warm, and you can go back to warm. So, so, so there's a lot of attention. Excuse me. There's a ton of attention paid to to, to that. how, like, like the color yeah. and the style that you're doing in that for a look. Place, yeah. 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 So, so you you had mentioned um, Resolve. So that's that's typically the software that you're working with. Yeah. Across the board. Yeah. And, and you know, Resolve, I think, affordable. I mean, anybody that's like on the higher level will probably use Base Light, but affordable wise you can get resolved for 300 bucks right mm -hmm. so like you can start grading this footage um i think you do need a licensed copy right to use with this camera for this yeah camera. yeah 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 for for the 10-bit footage you would need the yeah. license the studio version of it yeah. which is 300 bucks it's it's a no-brainer the, the reason why i went and shot with this piece i shot with the uh 24 to 105 and then we also did um which is an f4 mm -hmm. so that's you know and then we also use the Leica M lenses, mm -hmm. which I like, you know, because I think it's just easier on the Ronin, and I think they, they have a lot of character, and, and it's the only, I own those lenses. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend anybody buying those lenses from scratch unless you're rich, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, nobody would, you know, it's, the whole thing is I'm trying to make pieces that people can realistically do if they buy this camera. Mm -hmm. You know, not stick, I could stick Cook lenses that I have that are PL, you know, but that's not realistic to somebody that's buying this camera right now that's just running gun and somebody that's shooting whatever. It could be anything, weddings, events, yeah. or even their feature. They might have like, you know, lenses that they have right now that they can adapt to this camera. Yeah. That's the cool thing is you can attach any lens on here, even like old, old lenses like M42, screw oh, yeah, mount, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like you can literally buy like a whole set of lenses for like 500 bucks and shoot, yeah. you know? And it's it's not an overly sharp, like an ugly sharp camera. Mm -hmm. It shows the detail, but it's not like, that's the cool thing about Panasonic, they don't add sharpness, mm -hmm. which I like a lot of other cameras do. And and it sucks because you, the only way to, to not get that ugly sharpness is to shoot raw, mm -hmm. right? So like you'd force to shoot raw on their cameras where they don't do that with with these cameras. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you know, talking about RAW, we will, like we, we announced, yeah, which is I think going to be super cool, is, yeah, we'll which have... Which is great, but to be honest, you know, this camera is very flexible. I don't think, unless you're really, really 
just picky and you want to be a person that likes to shoot raw. I mean, yeah. I, I rarely shoot raw on my bigger cameras. <laughs> and we're, <laughs> you know, when we're shooting music videos and, and yeah. films, it's, it's it, you know, look, if, if you need to shoot raw because you don't know what the lighting conditions are on a cloudy day, that's an under, that's understandable. But yeah. if you're just shooting raw in a controlled area, or or a place that that's not super intense with the grade, they, I don't think that there's a point. Hmm. You know. Yeah, and, and I mean looks, obviously, look, raw looks good. Yeah. In general, it just it looks better. But like once you compress it, it's just like. Yeah, and what's the and point? with 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 the whole point, I think is that you know like you have that that flexibility where just like raw for photography for those watching and those those that are from that side being interested in this camera, you'll have a lot of the same control that you have for a raw stills camera. Just add it into the video for like what you said, those tricky yeah. situations where you may not have any control over it. Yeah. But you know, we'll, we will be able to um, output 5.9K uh, ProRes RAW to an Atomos Ninja 5, as well as a 4K uh, 60P. Yeah. I believe it's Cinema 4K 60P. Well, that's, a, that's, another, that's yeah. another good point, is if you need the high speed. Yeah, yeah, you get a lot of this this added extra benefit over HDMI in a camera again that's super flexible that says yeah. you know clearly if and surprisingly if like, the, the HDMI did not break yet on well, my camera so we've that that shows that it's pretty damn strong and I don't like yeah. HDMI yeah we've 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 had a long history those that have followed Panasonic for a very long time with you know going from mini HDMI to micro HDMI there's a reason we went full size on a yeah. pro camera. And Breaking a little HDMI you know, cable's not the fun. The camera comes with a protector. Yes. Definitely use that all the time. I just leave it on my cameras because it it just saves the life of the camera. Oh yeah. It saves the life. For real. Yeah. You know. Definitely. So so when it comes to like you know things like lens choices, like we were, yeah. we we touched on a little bit. So with with the the first piece you shot, um, you give us a little idea of like what lenses you used on that I shoot? Used, I used, um, if anybody wants to know, like millimeter wise, it was eight, um, it was 28, 35, and 50. And those are all uh, Sumalux and mm -hmm. Summicron lenses, cool. which are expensive. Um, they're and roughly around like 3,500 to like five grand per lens. I, I, the reason why I went with them is because they have hard stops, number one. When hard stop meaning I, the, the stop of the, the follow focus is hard stop. So it's easier for like a lower end. We use like this nano mm -hmm. uh, follow focus. So it, it would be a pain to like calibrate each point. Like on a yep. regular lens that has like a flywheel. So it was just much easier to calibrate while we're running and gunning. Yeah. Um, and then I own the lenses. That's, that's the only reason why I use them. Or else I would have went with, I don't know. We yeah. would have figured it out, but yeah. it, definitely having the small lens helps. Right. Definitely, cool. definitely, and, and and then I think the look of it, the characteristics, and the full frame. Mm -hmm. So like, I wanted to utilize the full frame on this camera. It's very hard to pull focus on full frame. <laughs> <laughs> it is like coming from Super Thirty Five. It's it's much easier, um, but it is beautiful. The, the you know having that larger canvas, having the larger. Um, and, and this is the other thing. So like we went with three lenses. So like 28 on a Super 35 would be an 18 full frame. Tech, well, full, 28 on full frame would be 18 on Super 35, if that makes any sense. And the cool thing about this camera is that you can actually punch in, do like a real 4K punch in, and it, you don't lose any of the Kodaks um, available. Mm -hmm. right? So it's yeah. still 400 and 400, yep. which is great, or 150 and 150 with the punch in. So Technically, if you can, with three lenses, you can have a set of six. Yeah. And yeah. not and not lose. So your 28 could be a 28 full frame or an 18 Super 35, or it could be a 28 Super 35, and technically it would be like a 35 yeah. or something like that. And vice versa, you know, the whole thing. It would be just. Yeah, like it basically that. gives you that full flexibility yeah. in that one yeah. camera package. Yeah, exactly. So. Looking at, and, and we, we've talked about it a bit, you know, like the, the overall robustness of a product like this. I mean, you know, like you, you said in the beginning, you know, you, you've shot this thing across the board in rain and then in the, the last piece you showed in the heat and dust, things like that. Were you ever at all concerned 
about no. the camera. And I'm going to say this. I mean, in the beginning, it's not my camera. Well. Um, <laughs> you know, but in the whole thing yes. is, and, and, that's, and that's how you really do a test because then you're not like thinking about it like a personal thing. Yep. So, yep. And, and it's smart for them to do that is to just give somebody like a, a test camera when they're testing the camera and it's not yours because then you start like, nobody wants to be attached to their cameras because then you're not going to do anything. Um, you just don't even think about it. And and I, you know, open the lens, there's no dust inside. And, you know, you hear the little camera, the camera rattles, but it has this like crazy stabilization built into this thing where even if your lens is not stabilized, like these lenses have stabilization built in, but the camera also has stabilization built in. And it's better than any other camera I've seen so far. And I'm not saying that it's, <laughs> <laughs> I, I shot like a lot of the pieces in the beginning, the um, the mix up, that whole night sequence was done at 4,000 ISO handheld because the gimbal couldn't move fast enough. It, mm. was, it just had this like weird delay and it almost felt as like cheesy as panning. You know, it just had that like weird, I don't know, it just couldn't, even on sport mode, I couldn't get it to like really react the way I wanted to react and, and the stabilization was good. Nice. Yeah. So, so that, that raises a point that actually I, I forgot then too. So, so how how has your experience been working with the fact that this camera is two native ISOs? I mean, you know, you're, yeah. you're used to working with a Vera cam, which yeah, has the right same thing. Home. But yeah. so, how how did it handle when you had to push it into four thousand onto the second? So native? that's that's the good thing about Panasonic too. Like they, Panasonic does not like lie about their specs, <laughs> right? So like if it's four thousand, they're not just going to say five thousand just to match the Vera cam, just to you know, appeal to other customers. Like, they know that this camera can shoot 640 and 4000, which is very respectable. Um, you know, the, the fact the fact is that this camera has a lot more shadow detail. Um, you don't want to underexpose, but it has a lot of shadow detail. So the 640 really doesn't bother me. And the 4000 I rarely go to. Mm -hmm. Unless like, that scene, we can go back to it um, and I can show people that scene was lit. We had to light that whole scene, but that was literally black out completely. There was no lights. There's no construction lights. We lit that whole entire staircase mm -hmm. um, with an L7 and like four quasars. Yeah. You know, so like those quasars are like 25 watts each. You know, you're you're talking about like practical level lighting. Yeah. Um, we lit the the whole side of the tank with a 600 watt. Uh, LED, like equivalent to a tungsten, if anybody like doesn't understand the conversions. Mm -hmm. And L7 is like, like I would say like a 500 or 600 watt tungsten light. Mm -hmm. And that lit the whole entire side of yeah. th the building. And that was like 150 foot, like 120 probably. Yeah. So, so, so most cameras that wouldn't have had that second native ISO probably would have struggled harder in a case oh yeah. like that. And, or and you would have had to bring in a ton yeah, more lights. A ton more lights. And, and, and then this is the thing. like. Looking at it on the computer screen, you will never see noise and blotchiness and, and the fixed pattern noise. We saw this on the big screen. There's no yep. noise. Like I was, I literally walked up 10 feet to that freaking screen and I was like, whoa. Yeah. Like I was surprised because I'm like, there has to be something wrong, you know? <laughs> like it's a little camera, there has to be something wrong, something's gonna give. So we looked at it and I was like, holy crap. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, when I, when I talked to the colors at the time, I'm like, there's no noise. And they were like, yeah, there's, there's no noise. Like, what you're seeing, they didn't apply any noise reduction. And I don't believe yeah. in noise reduction yeah. at all. Um, I, I just don't like it. Yeah. You know? so, so, I mean, they, that I think is one of the, the good points about that, too, is that, you know, when you're looking at what this camera can do and what overall the image you're going to get out of it, yeah. it is that fact that it can be pushed to these extreme mm -hmm. grades and hold up just like you yeah. know the ten, ten to hundred thousand dollar cinema cameras, yeah. but still be something that and you can throw a small little M lens on yeah. and just tool around with and capture shots that you yeah, wouldn't and, have got and, with those. And ones. I'm not going to tell anybody like so. So this is how like the Vericam works. Not to get off topic, but mm -hmm. like no, the no. Vericam does eight hundred and five thousand. Everybody, some people at Panasonic will tell you you can take it, you can dial it down. I don't, I don't think that's, I don't like doing that personally, because number one, you lose the dynamic range. So what happens is when you, when you dial, like if I, even at this S1H, it doesn't work like that because 
it, it's either 640 or 4,000. And if you want to take it down, either stop down or throw an ND on, right? Where the, where the uh, Barricam has the ability to go to a 5,000 base or an 800 base. So from the 5,000, you can dial down. You're going to lose noise. Well, they call it shot noise, which is yeah. true because it's shot noise is, is white noise. It's seeing past the light emission, emissions that are ICs. So like you get these like white flakes, which is really cool because it looks like film. Yeah. Right. So like yeah. it can add a look and it actually adds a nice texture to the skin. The only reason why I don't recommend anybody doing that is because I like keeping the full latitude of the, the actual film stock that you have. So 4,000 on here or 5,000 on Vericam is 14 and a half stops. This is 14.3. That's 14 and a half. I already did the test. <laughs> Um, there you go. So this is not. This is 14.2, 14.3. Um, I think 14.2 is at the 4,000, mm -hmm. and and the 640 is like 14.3, where the Vericam is like 14 and a half. But you know, with posts, you have a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend just leaving it at their natives, and then just put an ND or just stop down. Yeah. Um, you know, you can get 0.3s. You can get. You know, you can get different NDs to knock down that light. I think that, you know what happens is, if you're, say I'm shooting a billboard that's backlit. Let's just say it's in Times Square where you're shooting a television set. And you're like, okay, I could use a lot less light in this interior. And I have this TV set on. Now that TV set's going to blow out. And you're not going to be able to recover it because if anybody knows the charts of dynamic range, you lower the dynamic range in the highlights to gain more shadows, right? So what you want to do is you want to keep it at the highest. Yeah. Resolution. Yeah. You know, because it's, it, it ends up becoming like milky and you can't recover those highlights. So, yeah. so, so in a case like that, I and mean, that's where I'm know, able with, to save those highlights Yeah. on, uh, on that yeah. piece. You're able to see the, the, the bulb. Um, and that's why I wish, I, I wish we could play that again. If I could attach Wi-Fi because I really want to show it how it looks on Vimeo because I think yeah. the audience, the audience needs to see how, how the shadow detail is on, on that piece, because when if you walk into this place, this place is dark. It's like putting sunglasses on, and walking through there. Mm -hmm. And this camera is able to see the shadows, and I'm holding the highlights. I'm not blowing out any bulbs. Yeah. Which is is kind of nuts. Yeah. You know, because it's like, how the hell is this possible? Yeah. You know, you wouldn't. I like when I watch this footage, I'm like, it's not a small camera. It doesn't <laughs> look like a small camera. That's. That's the benefit of having this camera. It's so, the wow factor. Yeah. So, so basically, like with all these pieces, like you were saying, watching it over a live stream like this, or even here, you know, it's one experience. Um, the original piece that 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 um, you launched uh, at the beginning of the S1H launch, we do have that uploaded onto a number of different locations where it, it will actually trigger your display if you've got. If you're watching it on YouTube and TV yeah. or Vimeo, I think the live compression. yeah, it it will trigger it for the way it's graded, like we did at Dolby Vine. Yeah. Um, and the new piece that you shot, once once that's ready to go and it's up online, you know, you'll be able to see exactly what we're talking about, which is kind of that that fun part of live streaming, you know, where you've got that challenge of the added compression upon compression, pulling from a laptop. So. Shooting at, at, at those, the two different uh, native ISOs that you, that you, you work in, um, what kind of, you know, for, for some out there that, that are probably going to pose the question like, oh, well, you know, but lowering your ISO for some people is fine. Yeah. What, what kind of like NDs do you work with? You know, are um, you using like, you know, plate NDs, well, this variable? Is the thing. With, with this shoot that we did, I, not to say that Tiffin's cheap, but like, you know, we use a cheaper Tiffin filter. Um, it was a variable filter because it's just much easier to work with when you're on mm -hmm. the Ronin. You don't have to put a map box and, you know, all that stuff on there um, because you're really running around dangerous area and you don't want to use like, I have like Airy mm -hmm. FS NDs and those are like $5,000 for the set. Yeah. So like you don't want to use those NDs and get like sparks and metal hit your, you know, glass. It's just not cool. Sounds like first-hand knowledge. Yeah. So like, <laughs> you know, if you're in a situation like that, just use like a cheap, just like a cheaper hundred-dollar ND filter. Yeah. Which is cheap for an ND filter. Um, you know, I bought everything from here. Yeah. Um, and and it was just, you know, it was just, you know, obviously you get a little bit of cast, 
Yeah. You have to keep that in mind. You, with the with the ND filters, because it's two pieces of glass that are that are sort of angled in a way. Mm -hmm. So like you're gonna lose a little bit of quality, but if anything, it just adds a little softness to the, you know. Yeah. High resolution. It's actually working with the equipment that it's, you have and knowing yeah. its its limitations or its challenges. Yeah. I didn't yeah. really notice that much quality loss. Um, you know. But it so definitely protects the lens. No it definitely protects I, the I can lens. imagine in a place like that. Oh, you, dude, it was. You were I getting mean, pretty close to some of those, uh, those yeah. sparks and some of that uh, five to metal. Six, five to six inches on the sparks. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, like, yeah, about five to six inches. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, Places you wouldn't want to put a Veracam necessarily no, and, and unless you've got it protected. Yeah, and that area that Rick was walking out of, that is just literally grinding sand. So they, there's literally sand full. Like, you can't see it because it's very fine. Yeah. But this is the finest sand ever. Like, it's nicer than any beach that you've been in Miami. It's just <laughs> very fine sand. And, and the crazy thing is, if this didn't get into the camera, that means the camera is weather sealed. And it's got a fan. Keep that in mind. So, like, the side of this camera has a fan here and a fan here to blow out whatever exhaust, you know, from yeah. overheating which it never overheats. And I left this camera on seven hours. Yeah. I never shut it off, you know, on, on a hot day. Nice. Just nonstop. It, and it's, it's kind of crazy because when we shot the, the mix-up, the, the piece, the piece had, like, that Brooklyn piece was, like, 105 degrees that day. Mm -hmm. And we had, like, the sound devices, which is, like, a huge, like, a real deal sound recorder. Yeah. Or film mixer, whatever you call that thing. That shut off on us. <laughs> it couldn't handle the heat. It just shut off. The camera was just still going. Like, we literally had it, like, on the boardwalk. Or whatever you call that. The side, the side boardwalk that we had there. And, you know, there was waves splashing. And we just, you know, not to say that I didn't care about the camera. It's just, you know, when I spoke to Matt, Matt was like, hey, this camera's what they say it is. So, like, yeah. I wanted to, like, give... Give it a test, and and it was it's it's a really really amazing camera. Cool. In that sense, um, I don't know if can we get the Wi-Fi up? Because I would really like to. Is there a way to get this? I'm not sure. The uh, beginning Superstore Wi-Fi. So while we're waiting Show to set details? this part up, you have any questions? I just nope. got the, I just got the email. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, this is the camera that you are recommending. For, well, the, so this is the S1H. This is the, uh, our top spec uh, mirrorless interchangeable lens camera that's full frame for very heavily leaning into the cinematography side of the industry. We have two other versions of this camera, the S1 and the S1R. Those are both more uh, photography focused cameras, though the S1 can arguably be put very much in a similar category as the S1H, minus some of the more fine-tuned cinema controls like shutter angle, uh, anamorphic shooting, the 6K capabilities, things like that. Um, but they're both featuring this one and the S1H, or S1 and S1H, both featured 24 megapixel sensors in full frame. Uh, the difference is the S1H has a low-pass filter installed because one of the challenges with the S1 with a lot of uh, uh, videographers was that because it is so sharp in what our optics are capable to do and the resolution, you were getting more instances of moiré, which is a nightmare to correct in video. Those of us yeah. that are, I'm more of a photographer, so from the photography side, it's relatively manageable. Uh, but in this camera, knowing that this is a more cinema-oriented one, adding that low-pass filter in to eliminate that kind of challenge uh, but still maintaining that level of sharpness that's required and clearly, like we were saying before, has been well within the accepted ranges of what the Netflix Post Technology Alliance has certified for their level of uh, production camera for their originals. So um, hopefully that answers. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the, the question was, if you're recording for around 30 minutes or longer, will the camera continue to record or will you have to continuously 
reactivate the recording? So the answer to that is no. Um, the Historically with Panasonic, our GH, um, even a number of our regular G-series cameras and the S1 and the S1H have unlimited recording. You can record as long as you can feed this camera power and memory cards. A long time. So our our measured ratings, which are done in accordance with SEPA's standards for rating cameras, state that in 6K you're getting about two hours of recording on a battery. Now that's what a standard says. Now from yeah. personal experience, I would say in 4K you can get at least three and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I've in, done it. Yeah. I because they didn't send me batteries. I was stuck with one battery. I had to buy another one when I was shooting my commercial for Panasonic. And <laughs> so I, I, I bought a battery, I never pulled it out of the case. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And the cool thing is, it has USB-C, so any car, laptop, anything can charge this thing while you're not using it. So yeah. It's just, yeah, and it, and it, it will run of, off USB power too. So yeah. if you are shooting long form and you need to set a camera up, yeah. you can plug right in USB-C, the charging kit that comes with the camera yeah. for the battery. We'll doubles as a uh, AC adapter for the USB. Yeah. You can. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, of course. Well, keep in mind. Yeah. Well, this is why there's a little hole here, so you can get a D tap out. So they call it a dummy battery, yep. right? So if you pull this battery out, you you slide the the cable through here, right, and then you close this down, and now you can attach it to a bigger battery source, right, and then. I think on a 98 watt battery, you can run this camera for like 10 hours. Yeah. Literally. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Because we, we did it for an interview. We ran, a, we didn't even run out of the 98. And we were shooting, we didn't shut the camera off all day. Even during lunch, we just keep everything on. Just to keep it on. Because it's... So, so that's that's the kind of beauty of like the system. With uh, and this is not just us. There's a lot yeah, of cameras in geez. general. We have that ability to, in our case, uh, the part you'd look for is a DCC16. It's just a dummy battery that slides in and has a pigtail that mm -hmm. comes out. And then you can either get a D-tap adapter for that. We have an AC adapter to plug right into the wall. Yeah. And you're free to use basically whatever power solution you have as long as it's the right voltage being put into the camera. Because yeah. you can run into challenges where if you have a massive battery supply that's pumping too much power into the camera, you can damage any camera doing that. Yeah. But also, for like super can easy you flexibility, that? you can just throw, like if you have a, a USB battery bank that you use for like a cell phone, you can run and charge the battery, run and charge the battery over USB-C with this too. So if you, you don't have that, too, right? yes. Yeah, you can hot swap. Yeah. That's the cool thing. So like, even if your charger is sort of like, it's at its last like battery source, you can literally take the battery out. I haven't done this because I, I didn't need to, but you can literally take this out and then put another battery in Yeah. So while you're shooting. So I, I, ideally for a situation when you're shooting really long form, <clears throat> what I suggest to a lot of people is you get the battery grip for it because it's the same battery grip we use for the S1, S1R, you can tell the camera to run off the battery grip battery. Once that one dies and jumps into the in-camera, or actually it doesn't even have to die with this one, you can just pop that battery door, take one out, throw one in, and infinitely just keep rolling and rolling and rolling. So from a power solution, really, I think the engineers really thought about, you know, all of those kinds of situations. Um, but adding adding on to it, because um, it looks like you're ready, yeah. um, we can jump right back to yeah. quickly this the conversation about the piece and the foundry. Yeah, I so I just want to just point out, um, oh, this is, this place is, it literally looks this dark. This is not, there's no lighting involved. These are not blown out. And that's not blown out. That's, that's all there. The flame, this is very hard for a regular camera to do this. For any cinema camera to do it. I mean, there's a lot of dynamic range. In the shadows, there's no noise. There's no noise reduction on any of this stuff. I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> so, you know, um, if we could take down the lights. So hopefully my cell phone will have enough bandwidth for this.
as well which i forgot to um my mic's back on right okay so so another thing i want to point out is every camera can say they have good dynamic range right but when you mix colors like there's daylight sources in there tungsten sources do you see how you can see the difference between each source that's a big deal there's fluorescence there's daylight leds there's tungsten lights right that's three different sources that are really, like tungsten is good. And liquid metal. And, li <laughs> and liquid metal. You know, so it's just like, you know, when we went in there, it, you have to obviously shoot this place very differently because you're exposing for the malted lava that's over there. It, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's like, it, because that stuff is so bright, it's literally like the sun. So th this is the crazy thing. It, let me see. When they're pouring... Okay, so now, there's all that, sh this is a graded file. All that in there, my eyes can't see that when, when we were at the place. So it's just like, the fact that you can expose for this, I mean, there is some, there is some hot spots, but it, the color tonality is there. And then also like, this, this area is nuts. It's just really yeah. black and, and it has all that highlight detail being held. And the color tonality too, like this is what it really looks like where, you know, another camera wouldn't be able to produce the same colors. What I noticed is when you move the camera, it's very sharp. Anywhere that you turn, the image is very sharp. How you do Strong? It? Sharp? Sharp, yes. So the question was that, oh, we're you know, pulling as you focus pan, wirelessly. Is it sharp? We're pulling focus wirelessly. So there's a, let me... Hold on one second. I'm gonna so, show. I'm gonna show you my rig so you can get a better understanding because, um, I think you need to see the photos. Um, where did I put that last time? So, so you were talking about like the motion cadence. Like, how is it staying so sharp as you're moving? Well, and that's that's one of the things with with how we've built the the system and and the codex that we're working with is. The 6K footage, which is what that was shot in, is in um, was it's 200 megabit HEVC. So it's a relatively high megabit in a more efficient uh, compression. Still 10 bit, it's 420. Yeah. But one of the most important things is that you can have the best footage in the world, but if you're panning, you'll see a lot of times people who are inexperienced with panning can run into situations where you get a lot of jitter or, or even like you run a, into like, yeah. like softness and issues there. What's that thing called though? Everybody knows um, rolling shutter. Yeah, yeah, so or you get rolling shutter artifacts. And one of the things is that Nick is very accomplished with this. So being able to work and know, okay, the proper panning speed based on how you're filming. Yeah. And after just working with it, you start to be able to find out, you know, how fast you should move to maintain that sharpness and not have ghosting or motion cadence issues. And one of the things is that with the um, S1H, which is something that we just addressed with the firmware update for the S1, is that at, at the launch of the S1, there were some challenges with blue, uh, blue channel clipping and some ghosting that was already incorporated into the S1H because the camera was developed, like the firmware was finalized after that camera was sh uh, shipped. So as we work on these these codecs and we work on the encoding process and everything that we're, we're providing in the camera we pay a lot of attention to those things so you have minimal issues with it especially with the motion cadence part you, know, yeah. you want it to look as natural as you can and as sharp as you can without adding yeah yeah so yeah it's a combination of technology in the camera and the experience that that the user has with proper panning speeds and work like that so so this is typically what the rig looks like. Um, so, so realistically, it's hard to see here. Let me just pull up this one. Okay, so from a top view, this is what I was talking about with the, um, so this oh, is the, on- the top plate piece. On the top plate. So if you see in between, if you see in between like this area, there's like a little red um, circular piece in there. That, that has a hot shoe adapter that allows you to, to put a regular screw that you would put on the bottom of a tripod. So you can 
screw this down and lock it down to the hot shoe and then lock a plate on top. So in there, you're able to, to hook up, I would say, um, I mean, you wouldn't put a lot of weight on there, but it, it's hot shoe is strong. It can, it can handle some weight. Then, then I would attach, you know, I think these are wooden camera parts, and then you can attach a little micro file focus to this. This is like a really cheap unit that you can get from B&H, and, &H and um, you know, we just had to customize um, a file focus ring around the lens because these lenses have the little tabs, anybody that's familiar with Leica lenses. So it's, it's really annoying and I had to like zip lock it and make a whole custom thing for it, but it worked out well. And <clears throat> that's pretty much the rig, whether I go on tripod or, or on the Ronin. Um, <clears throat> and, and the whole thing is the motion blur thing that, that you guys are hearing about, a lot of cameras will have it if it's full frame. Or the what are they oh, called? Oh, the uh, rolling the shutter. The rolling yes. shutter. So, so realistically, you don't want to go past seven seconds, 180 degrees, right? So if your shutter angle is at 180 degrees, seven seconds. Not everybody breaks the rules. You know, if you're shooting Jason Bourne or whatever, this <laughs> obviously you're gonna go left and right really quick. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're looking to get smooth pans and tilts. You don't want to have crazy motion um, with, with, with the camera. I would take it down to a 4K. The 4K is a lot faster, the motion cadence on there. Yeah, and, and that's, that's with, with the technology in general, 6K will have more ish, 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 that instances yeah. of rolling shutter because you're reading out the full sensor. <clears throat> yeah. But that's why we also have the ability to punch in for a Super 35 crop or even a pixel to pixel. So if you are in a situation where you do have to do a whip pan, yeah. frame it a little bit differently, back up a little bit or more, really set it in Super 35, and your readout speed's much, much faster. So you yeah. can you have more latitude for yeah. that kind of motion. And, and this is the thing, like, all right, so say I'm going from wall to wall, right? I know I'm gonna go super slow. If I'm panning from, it, let's just say in the edit, let's just say there's a tree, and I'm gonna whip it down, who cares about rolling shutter? Because there's so many little pieces that it's just gonna motion blur anyway, right? But if you're going, if you're getting lines, and I've ran on the soccer field um, with, that, with that athlete um, across, and, and there was like lines, straight lines on the soccer posts, you know, for the goalies, and, and that didn't sway. So the fact that it was steady, this is the thing, if you're close, right, you won't get that. I mean, if you're close, you're gonna get Weird motion blur. No. But if you keep your distance and you pan it across, just like when you're looking on a highway, right? Car doesn't look like it's driving fast, but when you look to the side, you look like you're going really fast. So take that, take that consideration because your eyes are going far out, right? And when you look in at the trees or the posts on that side, it looks super fast. So just take a step back, shoot it in 6K and punch in. You understand what I'm saying? So, so the further you are away from the subject, the less motion blur you're gonna have because it doesn't have, it's processing a larger scale of an image, yeah. right? I haven't told that to anybody. So <laughs> yeah, so like. You're, you're saying if your background is wider, yeah, if you, you it, won't see it, the. Yeah, so like, let's just say. As much as if you Yeah, exactly, so like, let's. By really quickly, mm -hmm. then so let's say like, I'm going yeah. from this, like obviously if you're going through a door, you don't wanna do it fast, but like, say we're shooting in the city and we're going really fast in a car, right? So instead of me being from here to here, shooting a, a, a post that's, that's a line, I would step back a little bit, and it's just the same distance if, you punch it, if you're punching in. So like if you're shooting 6K, that's the benefit of shooting 6K. I don't really care about shooting 6K. I'd rather shoot 2K, honestly. It's just easier on the edit. But you know, you can use these resolutions for your benefit. So. Yeah. To, to rescale and, and reframe. Uh, I don't like reframing, but like in, in this instance that you know that you're gonna get rolling shutter, you can reframe. You can punch yeah. in, step back. You know, it depends on what you're doing, obviously. Now, yeah. if you're doing video, what type of lens do you use? I, well, on my cinema cameras, yeah. I use, right now I use Ingenues and Cooks mostly. Um, 
I, 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 I mean, I really like, I mean, I don't know. I, I've tested, I've tested the new RE primes. They're nice. I, I really like those. And, and those cover a, a number of large sensor cameras. Um, you know, if you're gonna shoot on large format. I, yeah. I, I definitely would, would love to see a company make an LPL adapter for them because those lenses are really beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I think I think it would be really cool yeah. to shoot, even though the lenses are like this big and they're prized, but they're really beautiful. Because one thing I like about like Cooks is that you can focus super close. So that 32 or that 25 can really, you know, you can move in and out and, and not have to change the lens so often. Yeah. And when you use it, you shoot? I shoot on a Leica. I shoot on a Leica rangefinder film or digital. I have them both, um, and I haven't shot pictures on this. I just use this for video. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure it takes great pictures. It's just I'm not going to carry a big camera like this for fun. And I've been shooting pictures for fun lately. Um, a lot of stuff like at night. What lens yeah. you use in the Leica? I use Leica, um, Leica Summicrons and Summa Lux. Um, yeah. I tried other lenses. It's just. I don't know, I feel like there's something special about the Leica body and the Leica lens. I know that a lot of people think that, you know, Leica people are fanboys, but it's it's a really it's a nice image. I just bought a oh, Leica 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 gives a nice image. I mean, you know, I was lucky enough to save up my money and and get it. Um, yeah. Well and that's that's one I of the wasn't, reasons. I wasn't handed one, I had to actually <laughs> buy one. That's um, that's one of the nice reasons why like we're partnered with with well, Leica, yeah, exactly. and, and I, we've yeah. been partners with Leica for a very long time yeah. in the imaging side yeah, of the even industry. Even on the Vericam, when I, when yeah. I was at um, NAB uh, for the past couple of years, um, you know, Panasonic Vericams, you know, they always pair pair them with Leica. Leica and Panasonic have like a very good relationship together. Yeah. Um, that's I mean, not the reason why I use the Leicas, by the way. No, no, you no, know, no. I just had them, so yeah. I just, I said, why not? Why am I gonna, you know, I tried to find like old you know, FD lenses and old lenses to just kind of give it character. But then it's just, it's very hard to find a usable set that's clean. Um, and I just wanted to make my, my lenses work since yeah. I had them. Because like anybody that would want to buy this camera, right? Let's just say you have Nikon or Canon lenses or whatever lenses that you have, even if they're old. Or even you might have like Leica R lenses, which are beautiful. You can get adapters for this camera and you can use them. And there's no limitations because you can even use Super 16 lenses on here and do the 1080p pixel to pixel. So like even if you have an old B4 mount, there you, you can go. still mount, not that anybody, I don't want to use B4 lenses, but you know, because they're huge. <laughs> or anamorphic, I mean, I haven't shot anamorphic on these, um, but the cool thing is you can actually do real anamorphic where other Super, uh, Super 16 cameras um, they're not doing a real anamorphic because you're, you can't crop Super 16, um, Super 35, 16 by 9 or 17 by 9 anamorphic. You need the full height, right? You can get that with this camera. You can get that yes. with this camera. So like, Stretch, yeah. Square. Yeah. So and that's the, the cool thing. Like I own an Alexa SXT, right? So the cool thing is if I'm shooting anamorphic, I can still have this as my B cam, you know, and, and shoot those weird POV looking shots. Like, I always say, digging a shovel, you guys think I'm gonna murder somebody. But we are shooting a horror film <laughs> coming up. And it's about this mob guy that's, that's um, that, that, you know, kills people with zucchinis. But, you know, if we are gonna do a scene where we are gonna dig a hole, you know, like in Goodfellas, they're digging a hole, you can still get that perspective, just attach this to like a standard pipe clamp from Matthews and just get like, you know, the regular hot shoe yeah. on the bottom, attach your lens on it, get that quick shot, and then mix it in, because it's only for a couple seconds. Yeah. I'm not gonna say you're gonna mix this with like different brands, but if you have little cutaways here and there, you can. But any real colors can match this camera. Yeah, and, just, and to the anamorphic colors, point, though. with the anamorphic point, you know, that's kind of one of the, the <clears throat> hallmarks that we've had from the GH5 even, yeah. is that we have a true four to three anamorphic yes. mode in the camera. That'll also allow you to monitor de-squeezed and you still shoot in log and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And it's still Your a 10-bit line. monitor needs to be yes. able to de-squeeze anamorphic. It will not send the signal out. 
which is fine. Most monitors these days will send it out. Yeah. Um, so the other thing is, if if you're going to go anamorphic on this camera, keep in mind, you're de-squeezing a, a, an area that's a select area of pixels, and you're stretching them two times. So anything you do, movement-wise, will be amplified twice, or or one eighth, or one or one three three, whatever anamorphic lenses you decide to use, it will be magnified by that. Uh, or multiplied, really, not magnified. Um, yeah. So, so like that's the other thing. So like a lot of people be like, oh, the rolling shutter, this and that. So like, keep in mind, you're using anamorphic. You know, there's there was a shot. I was talking to Matt about this. There was a shot on a on a, on a red Vista Vision Dragon or whatever, and that's full frame. And they had rolling shutter in the shot, and they kept it. Nobody notices it. Filmmakers notice it, but other people won't notice it. Um, but they had it in the show. They kept it. And 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 I think that. I think that you know you just have to like, pay attention to what, what you're shooting, mm -hmm. rehearse it. That's why there's rehearsals and blocking and, and and figure out you're not just running and gunning. And if you are, just you know keep in mind that, you know, that's yeah. look at the screen and see how it, how the motion is. Oh, and I think that's very important. I think, you know. Set aside any brand, doesn't matter. Like I'm not brand loyal to anybody. I just like to use the best tools that will help me on my job do the right work, right? So like I have the select cameras that I work with and I'm not gonna use anything else because I trust them and I don't have to, I just don't, I don't care about using anything else, really. Um, cool. So I think it's very important to test brands. Don't, don't listen to, to forums and, and like, People will sit on forums all day long, and this person said this and this and this, and it's just, it's just like you're not shooting. You should be out there shooting. I will literally set up, you know, I will buy, I will go to B and H and buy ten different brands of lights, LEDs. LEDs are horrible, you know. If if you don't test them, you really have to test them out. Uh, same thing with lenses and cameras. Every camera is horrible until you test it, you know. So I think you know, test it out. You know, I literally did a lighting test the other day for an hour and a half, two hours, in my backyard, set up. It's freezing cold out. Just test it out. See how, no, seriously, I mean, you get, because if you don't test these things, I guarantee if, if I shot four different brands, I guarantee nobody would be able to tell the difference. Yeah. I guarantee it. So putting, be, putting the right tool in I capable think, hands. Exactly. Be, like if you have a director yeah. or an art director or a creative director, whoever you're getting hired from, I think that, that you, it's beneficial for you to test it with that director if you have a chance or do a test and send it to the person that's hiring you and say, hey, listen, this is, this is the test. This is the reason why. You, right away, if you do a blind test, forget about any, any sort of brands. Test them out, you know? Why is this lens, why is this camera good for you? And right away, when I tested this camera, I'm gonna tell you guys the truth. I, I told Matt, you know, he was begging me to test the GH5 when it came out. And I was like, I don't like small cameras. That's what I told him. And it, it's kind of like a, you know, horrible thing to say. I just don't like small cameras because you have to build them out. And you know, I haven't really, bless you, and I haven't really um, found a, a small camera that I was like, eh, the image is, it, it's worth it that much so I can actually build out a cage <laughs> and do all this stuff to it and deal with HDMI, which I hate. Um, bless you. And, you know, when I tested this camera in Miami when I was there, when I first got, I was like one of the first people to get this camera. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm testing it out and shooting it. And I wasn't convinced until I went to the laundry room. Okay, and, and the cool thing about this laundry room Nothing cool about it, but it had one little window. This laundry room was pitch black. You had to flip the light on to actually get any light on in there. And I tested it out and I exposed for the highlights coming in. There was full blast coming in through that window. And I'm, and I'm looking at it. And on the monitor, on the small monitor, you can't really test because everything looks great, just like an iPhone, you know? Yep. <laughs> so when I went back upstairs and I plugged it in, and I'm looking at it. And you see the amount of shadow detail, and the window is not blown out, and I still see detail outside. I'm like, what the hell is going on? This camera's good. 
you know, so I started doing, I started, I called up Matt and I was like, hey, this camera's really good. I would like to, you know, shoot the piece for Panasonic because I actually like this camera. You know, <laughs> I'm not gonna, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shoot a piece if I didn't really believe in this camera. You know, but, well, the camera, the camera is cool. It, it really is. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, the mob film. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's so, cool. so I guess um, you know we'll show one more piece, and then um, I mean you know we've been going for about an hour and twenty minutes, so it's probably about a good time to stop there, and then uh, you know we we're going to be monitoring questions and things like that in post, and Let me just double we'll hang around and... a little bit afterwards, and we can uh, kind of chat. Let me just double check and make sure that this is yeah, it seems okay. All right, cool. Just want to make sure so people can really watch a good version of it. Cool. Yeah. Oh, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Whoa, that's not how you deal, you deal one at a time all around. What, okay, Who okay. taught you how to deal, Carl? All right, all right. One, two, three, you really four, want. five. Get the phone. Uh, why don't you get the phone? I always get the phone. Get the phone, Tony. Okay, okay. This kid, I don't know I, I don't know what I'm going to do with this kid. Do you don't know what to do. What, what, what am I going to do with this guy? You don't listen to nothing? Hurry up. You're holding up the camera. i got to chase this guy. Hurry up. It might happen. That bossy charge. Frankie. Yeah, Frankie, this better be good news. That's what I called you. Look, I, I, I just got here. The stuff just got here. It's about time. I've been sitting here waiting very impatiently. All right, don't don't worry, Paul. It's not going anywhere. I, I, I promise. I got my eyes on it. It's staying right here. Listen, don't Sit tight. We'll be right there. Calm down. Calm down. What's the matter? The stuff's in. We're ready. We're going to hit Fitzy's joint tonight. Let's go. Tonight? All right. Tonight. Frankie, oh, talk to me. I've been here the whole time. There's no security. All right, what are we looking at? Joe, with the rats, they could be a pretty big shipment. A couple of pounds. All right, let's go in. No nonsense. In and out. Let's go. Let's do it. Come on, Tommy. I'm trying to open Come on. Give me a minute. Open huh? the damn thing. Come on. I got you got it. All right, all right. Kind of a nice funny twist at the end there. That was great. So I think um, you know with that we've been going on for a little while now, and that's, yeah. that's probably a good good place to end uh, end for today. Yeah. So I um, want to thank everybody for tuning in, listening with us, and um, you know listening to to Nick here talk about the experience of the S1H and some of the other aspects of filmmaking and, and the work that he does. Um, where can, pe can people find you online and see yeah. some of the stuff yeah, we'll here? Yeah, we'll have and, all the links. Um, and, and don't be afraid to, to send me a message. I'll get back to you guys about, about any information. Um, yeah. I'm pretty good about that. If anybody has any questions or anything like that about the camera. Yeah. yeah. Leave it in the comment section, and yeah. I'm sure we'll be uh, following up and taking a look. So, Thank again, you. thanks for, for joining us, those online and those in, in the uh, store here. And uh, we'll see you next time.